What's going on YouTube? Josh here checking in. Welcome back to episode number three of The Comeback. Thank you for tuning in. We've got some good topics to discuss today. Today's date, I believe, is April the 10th. April the 10th. It's 10.30 at night and I have to be up tomorrow to go to work at 4 a.m. So I'm gonna try and do this in one cut. Please bear with me here. So a um, few things, just kind of general things. It's, it's freaking April. It's the beginning of April and I am sweating like a fiend at 10 o'clock at night in my home gym with two fans running. So I'm gonna start a GoFundMe for the Strength Doc Gym air conditioning unit. I'm totally playing with you guys, definitely not starting to go fund me, although I'm seriously going to think about getting an AC in here because it's only April and I do not want to know what the summer has got for me. So anyway guys, today I wanted to talk a little bit about a few things. The first thing is going to be sort of my general approach to how I've decided to program these sort of early portions of the comeback. As I mentioned in a previous video, I'm essentially following a linear progression. Essentially adding weight to the bar every single week. So for my lower body lifts, I'm adding typically five pounds. For my upper body lifts, I'm adding between 10 and 15 pounds for the most part. And so basically the way I have this set up is I have an upper lower split. Uh, the reason for that is basically you've got a few options. Essentially the three main options for setting up programming are full body, you can do upper lower or you can do sort of more like a, a push pull legs split. Now I suppose that there is a fourth kind of way to divvy up your programming which would be your typical bro style bodybuilding split. So I'm not a bodybuilder one and two even bodybuilders, most of the educated bodybuilders know that for the most part uh, bro splits are not necessarily the best. So anyway that leads us to those three, uh, three I believe that I mentioned before. So why am I not doing full body? Well the problem with full body is you're looking at pretty much guaranteed three days a week. Doing four days a week of full body is very challenging uh, because you really need at least one day off in between and it just kind of it gets a little bit difficult to really do full body four days a week in my opinion. The other issue I have with full body is I like to do a little bit of a warm up. I don't do nearly as much warming up as I used to do in the past. That being said, it's still kind of a pain in the butt to have to warm up for lower body and then once you're done with that, warm up for upper body or vice versa. It just takes more time. I'd rather just be dedicated to sort of that one thing. So my personal preference is primarily a kind of upper lower split. And so the way I have it set up is I'm training my upper body three days per week, my lower body two days per week. That's a total of five training days. Now, if you're going to be setting up an odd number of training days, typically five or seven in that case, which would be kind of crazy. But if you're doing that, you're typically going to give your upper body that additional day as opposed to doing say three days of legs and two days of upper body. The rationale for that is just, you know, your upper body is able to recover much better uh, from higher volumes for the most part. It's really rare to see anybody who can recover better for lower body days. If that's the case, you're probably not pushing yourself. So the way that I've set this up, since I have these sort of, we'll kind of discuss it as far as the upper body and the lower body sessions. So for the upper body, I essentially have two days that are sort of more focused on horizontal pressing movements. So you could say bench press focused. And then I have one of my upper body days of the day that's kind of sandwiched in the middle, focusing on vertical pressing, which is you know more like your overhead press. So let's talk about the horizontal pressing days. The way I have that set up is essentially one day that's a volume day and one day that's an intensity day. And so, you know, the most simple way to do that, especially because the type of training that I'm doing right now with a linear progression is quite simple. All that I've done is I've sort of modulated the way that I, I do the reps, okay? Uh, meaning how many reps per set. So on my volume days, I'm doing say eight to 12 days, which is the footage that you've probably been seeing overlaid throughout this whole thing. You may have noticed that for my bench, I think I was doing maybe four sets of eight, something like that. Um, you know, and then for incline press, I'm doing sets of 10, things like that. So that's sort of more my volume day. And then on my intensity day, I'm doing sets more in the four to five range. Um, maybe six, something like that, right? And so on that day, I'm doing obviously higher intensity, 
But interestingly, what I've decided to do is be pretty much volume equated. And what I mean by that is uh, I'm specifically referring to um, just the volume for sets and times reps. Excuse me, I'm not referring to um, the load as well, um, the volume load, which is the sets times reps times the weight, uh, just because that's a little bit more hard to equate. Although, you know, typically what you'll see is most people on their intensity days, they'll do lower overall volume. So say on my, um, uh, let's talk about my, my volume day. Let's say I'm doing bench press and I do 30 total reps. For the most part, uh, when you do an intensity day, you'll do say 20 reps or 24, something like that. You're typically gonna do less reps on that day. I've chosen to uh, have higher volumes on my intensity days. Why? Because I can handle it. Um, you know, because at this point in my training, for the most part, I'm not really pushing myself to the point where recovery is a major issue and I'm trying to provide a stimulus for growth. And so there's really no reason why I should be needing to back off. Now, if I was at my peak, if I was super strong, if I was really pushing myself, then yes, I would have to do that. Although in this case, I've opted not to do that. Now let's talk a little bit about how I structure the lower body days. So like I said, I've got two lower body training sessions. One of them is gonna be squat focused and one of them is deadlift focused. So interestingly, for regarding the deadlift, I've chosen, as you've probably noticed by now, if you've been staying tuned, watching the lifting footage, I'm lifting both sumo and conventional. Now, as a power lifter, I know it's kind of weird even calling myself a power lifter at this point, being as I've taken a almost two year hiatus from competition, just weird, I need to get back into it, and hence the comeback. So, as a power lifter, I pull in competition conventional, or at least I have for the past three or four meets that I've done. Um, just feel stronger in the, in, excuse me, I, I pull sumo. I think I said conventional. It's like 10.45 or 10.30, guys, I'm sorry. Anyway, that's the stand, I do sumo in powerlifting competition. And so, because of that, you think, well, why don't you just train sumo all the time? I've chosen to train conventional as well for a few reasons. One, I'm just getting my strength back. Two, it's fun, you know, mix things up a little bit, do something a little bit different. And three, a lot of power lifters actually recommend just training both lifts. Uh, just that way, you know, say you pull an adductor or something and you can't sumo deadlift. Well, guess what? At least your conventional doesn't completely suck. So that's why I'm training both of those lifts. Now back to how I'm structuring the training. Uh, as far as the training is concerned, I'm basically having one day, that, like I said, squat focused, one day that's deadlift focused. So on the deadlift focused day, I'm starting off with sumo deadlifts. Why? Because that's the most important lift of the day. Always start off the day with the most important lift. The accessory stuff, the things that you care about least, you do that later on. You do big stuff that you care about first. So I do my sumo deadlifts, I do some accessories for deadlifts, and then I go into um, you know, some squat kind of accessories. Maybe not the, my competition squat, maybe a different kind of squat, and I'll talk about that either at the end of this video if I still have enough wind, or in another video. Now, on my squat focus day, I'm starting off with squats, doing some squat variations, and then I'm moving into deadlift. In this case, because it's my squat focus day, I'm gonna do the deadlift that I care about least, the conventional deadlift. It's not to say that I'm not giving it you know, good effort, but the reality is, is once the weights start going up on my squat and I start getting tanked, well, you know what? I'm not gonna be 100% going into those conventional deadlifts and quite frankly, don't care because like I said, I don't really train, I don't really compete conventional and you know, I'm still gonna get stronger. It's not like I, I'm not you know, training that lift, it's just that if it was really my number one priority to get strong at the conventional deadlift, well, I would probably not do it towards the later half of my workout. So that is sort of how I'm structuring my programming. I am really thirsty right now because I've just trained and I'm freaking thirsty. All right, so that is that. Is that. Um, Wanted to talk about just a few other things. So that's kind of like the general stuff in the programming. If you guys are still listening to this, thank you. Um, you know, if you have questions about any of the programming stuff, be sure to post that stuff below. And I also just wanted to talk a little bit about some sadistic stuff I'm doing with my training. So one thing that I've done on my lower body days, which I just did, so I'll talk about that because that's fresh. After I deadlift and do my deadlift accessories, I do front squats ass to grass with 30, uh, excuse me, 90 seconds rest, 
And then I go into sets of 10 for lunges, but not re regular lunges, front rack lunges. So first off, front squats. I only did front squats with 185 today, and I'm sure if you saw my face, it's, I don't know if it's gonna be over this part of the video, but if you saw my face in that, you know that it's not that fun. Well, you know, maybe it's fun if you're a, a sadist. You know, so front squats are legit. They are one of my favorite squat variations. They are underutilized, and I think that's because most people feel uncomfortable getting into a front rack position. You know, their wrists, they feel like I don't have the wrist mobility, I can't get my elbows up, etc., etc. They have difficulty with core stabilization. You know, quite frankly, I was feeling my abs pretty darn good on those sets. I'll be honest, when I used to do front squats and not go ass to grass, I didn't really feel as much in my abs. The other thing is when you're going full depth on the front squat, if you're doing it nice and slow and controlled, which is my recommendation to do this lift very slow and controlled because otherwise you lose some tension at the bottom, it's very easy to get out of position and the whole thing is messed up. So when you're staying nice and tight, you're going ass to grass, you're also gonna to tend to feel a lot more in your glutes because you need those glutes to basically drive straight up out of the hole as opposed to kind of being topped forward. So that's front squat, they're awesome. Go out there, do some front squats, and if you're gonna do them, and you're not used to doing them, start off very lightly, increase just a little bit, go ATG or as low as you possibly can without you know severe butt wink, um, and go really slow into the descent. Those are my two tips for the front squat. So after front squat, I go into the sadist, the most sadistic thing that you could do, which is, you know, after those front squats with relatively short rest intervals, I go right into front rack lunges. These are not regular lunges, these are not dumbbell lunges, these are not, no, front rack lunges. So the reason for this is a few reasons. Well, so it allows you to work on your mobility for the front rack with a, a weight that is lighter than what you're probably using for your front squat. So that's another opportunity to practice your front rack position. The other thing is, it's additional core stabilization, and I didn't even mention for the front squat, but it's the same thing here. Anytime you're in that front rack position, it's a lot of upper back musculature. You know, I'm sure you'll notice in the videos, I'm a little bit kind of have a bit of kyphosis in the thoracic spine. That's sort of just to get those shoulders forward, so that way you have a nice little rack for the bar to kind of rest on like that. You know, but that's really not so much of an issue. Nonetheless, you still need to have isometric contraction on your upper back in order to stay tight. These exercises, the front rack lunges, will make a man out of you, especially if you're not used to doing unilateral exercises. You know, I've been doing this now for eight weeks and I finally have my balance somewhat, but damn, is that a cardio workout? I am huffing and puffing at the end of 10 on each leg, so 20 total and you will feel the burn, my friends. Go out there and do some front rack lunges. I'm sure there's some other stuff that I could think about talking about regarding my upper body sessions, but you know what? There are a lot more episodes to go. This is one of the longer videos on the channel because I'm just rambling, and at this point, it's nearly 10.45. I have to shower, have a little protein shake, a little bit of creatine in that too, and try and go to bed because I am wired right now. So anyway guys, that's the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up and stay tuned for the next one. I'll catch you guys next time.